people have asked me for years, when's gold going to move? And I say, 2000. Price of gold in 2000 was $253, $254 an ounce. Uh, and it moved up to sort of $1,900 an ounce. So that's what, 8.6, 8.7% compounded for 22 years. If you're asking uh, for a commodity that as a savings instrument could shield you against inflation, uh, if you look at when gold was going to move at the beginning of the century, it did move. The move has uh, accelerated and it has excited people. Um, to me, the move that we've seen so far is a non-event, really. Uh, I think it's a flow of funds issue. Uh, I don't own gold because I think it might go to 2400 or 2200 or whatever the number is. I own it because I'm afraid of the possibility, not the probability, but the possibility that it goes to $7,000 or $8,000 or $9,000. That's not very far-fetched. In the decade 2000 to 2010, admittedly, it took 10 years, the gold price went up sevenfold. It doesn't seem like too much to ask, given the deterioration in the purchasing power around fiat instruments, for the gold price to triple. I frankly hope it doesn't, but I sort of think it will. Let's examine, uh, James, the recent strength in the gold price. This didn't happen because retail investors were concerned, expressing concerns about the deterioration of their purchasing power. It didn't happen for traditional reasons. It happened because the U.S. government weaponized the U.S. dollar. They confiscated $300 billion worth of Russian holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. That made other countries who don't necessarily favor policies that are attractive to the U.S. government, concerned about their own holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. The second thing that the U.S. did is they weaponized the SWIFT banking system. The SWIFT banking system is supposed to be an international settlements mechanism using the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. It is not the property of the United States. But when the SWIFT banking system began to be weaponized to further the political interests of the United States government overseas, other central banks felt themselves left with no choice other than to look for a, a store of value at a medium of exchange that was outside of the control of the U.S. government. The easiest place to go was gold. Many people say, well, why don't they just trade with each other in their own currencies? There's an easy answer to that. As little as they trust us, they trust each other less. <laughs> the U.S. dollar uh, laughingly is the worst currency in the world with the sole exception of every other currency. The Chinese don't want a trillion rubles. Uh, and what that means is that in order for Iran to trade with China, China to trade with Russia, Russia to trade with Brazil, they need a medium of exchange outside the U.S. dollar. And the strength that you have seen in gold has been almost entirely foreign central banks buying gold because they don't have any other alternatives. If you lay on top of that uh, the realization on the part of investors that their own purchasing power is degraded by, hold, by holding fiat currencies, uh, I think you could see sharply higher gold prices. Here's another statistic to support that, James. According to J.P. Morgan Chase, the market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets in the United States is about one-half of 1% 1 of the total value of savings and investment assets in the United States. For reference, the United States has a 23% market share of world savings and investment assets. J.P. Morgan Chase suggests that the four-decade mean market share of precious metals-related securities is 2%. So if precious metals merely reverted to mean, demand for precious metals and precious metals-related assets would quadruple in the largest savings and investment market in the world. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. Just a reversion to mean. Just a reversion to mean quadruples demand. Remember that prices are set on the margin. 
not across the totality of the market. And I think that that could, not next week, not the week after, maybe not this year, maybe not next year. I think if you think in five-year terms, six-year terms, seven-year terms, and you think about the continued politicization of the U.S. dollar, if you think about the deterioration of the purchasing power of U.S. dollars, particularly given low interest rates relative to the deterioration of the purchasing power of the dollar, and then you think about the infinitesimal market share enjoyed by precious metals, those three factors come together, and I think they give you a picture uh, of what I actually believe is likely to occur in precious metals markets, which is to say not only higher, but sharply higher. So I would agree with you. The move we've seen so far has been lackluster. That's how I would define it. But you made mention of the fact that the move in gold in the early 2000s, when it went up seven times. Why, so why did it go up seven times? Why was it the move in the early, uh, what was that? 2000 to 2010 or 2012, why was that move so aggressive and why haven't we seen that yet? Well, the first part of, well, not the first part of the move, the middle part of that move, 2002 to 2006, uh, I, I think was a lot about uh, the perception of the end of U.S. hegemony uh, and uh, continuously lower interest rates, both real and nominal and a a, a continued uh, weakness in the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. Uh, I think it was all about that. There was also uh, a form of inflation that wasn't felt throughout the economy, but there was raw material inflation. While the price of consumer goods fell through the decade uh, as a consequence of advances in technology and productivity, the price of basic commodities fueled, I would suspect, largely by Chinese demand uh, was very, very strong. And I think that some of the luster that gold enjoyed during that decade was reflected luster from other parts of the commodities complex. But I I need to say I'm not an economist. I'm really, truly out on a limb here. Uh, I'd be leery about describing the whole causation. Uh, I just wanted to point to that event to put the possibilities of this market in context. Now, you also made a good point about central bank buying. I believe they bought or acquired 25% of gold production in 2023. They did the same thing in 2022. So the retail investor, the institutional investor has not really participated yet in this move. And there's still a, I think I would refer to it as complacency complacency. Would you agree with that? Until 12 days ago, uh, if you measure retail interest by the physical gold ETFs, retail investors have been sellers. (laughs) They haven't been complacent at all. (laughs) They've been bearish. They've been selling. The psychological impetus that the market's got from gold breaking out to uh, at least nominal as opposed to real highs has been such that the last 12 or 13 days uh, have seen inflows into the ETFs. But before two weeks ago, uh, it isn't as though the retail investor was neutral. The retail investor, uh, as expressed by data, was bearish. I think that changes. <laughs> I, I really, truly think it, cha- it changes. If you, if you consider the biggest enemy of gold to be the U.S. 10-year Treasury, uh, the ultimate fiat uh, instrument, let's think about the arithmetic around Uh, the U.S. 10-year treasury. The U.S. government promises to pay, and they will, even if they have to print, you 4.2 or 4.3% per year on your savings. In a currency where the current, where the depreciation of the purchasing power is 7%, which means that the U.S. government in actuality is promising to make you poorer by 2.5% a year compounded for 10 years. I think they'll keep that promise but it's not a very attractive one. So I would suggest to you that ultimately in the psyche of investors, gold's competition is an instrument which promises to make you two and a half percent a year poorer for 10 years. I think gold can stand up to that fight. 